can't tell you how many patients come to our office scared because they went to another clinic. They were put into a hyperbaric chamber. None of this was explained. They started having pressure in their ears. They didn't know what to do. Then they started having pain in their ears, and then they panicked. And while you may or may not actually cause any physical damage, that situation also creates emotional, you know, emotional trauma with regard to completing their therapy or ever wanting to try hyperbarics again. One of the biggest, probably the most common issue that a patient is ever going to have inside of a chamber is pressure in their ear with the inability to equalize it. We talked last time about hand signals. Hey, something's wrong with my ear communicating with us that something's an issue. We need to help them manage. We need to stop the travel of the chamber. We need to help manage them, keep them comfortable help them equalize so that we can keep going uh, through the session. I've said this before, I'm saying it again. Patients are never supposed to have pain inside the chamber. If a patient is having some type of pain, especially a sharp pain with an acute onset, something's wrong and you need to manage that. You need to figure out what it is and help them deal with that situation because they're not supposed to have pain in the chamber. And our job is to make sure that they don't and how to keep them comfortable. There are really only two absolute contraindications to hyperbaric oxygen. We've talked about these before, but pneumothorax. So you'll never put a patient with a collapsed lung inside the chamber. And that's especially important now uh, with, you know, with COVID and the possibility of having some certain lung issues. So if you have or suspect issues around any of this, you know, you might want to have a chest x-ray on patients to just double check and make sure that there's no uh, pneumo issues. The only other absolute contraindication is the inability to equalize your ears. You would think that the inability to equalize your ears being something that's actually manageable, since it's one of the only two con absolute contraindications to hyperbaric oxygen, that we would spend more time talking to patients about this issue just to eliminate the idea that it's even going to be a problem in your office. On our intake forms, I have seven different questions about how they understand their ears, their ear function, and what kind of issues they've had in the past with regard to ears, pressure changes, or their ability to equalize. I'm trying to identify who the people are that are going to have an issue equalizing their ears and who the people are that are experts, no issues. I know exactly what that is. I scuba dive every weekend to 150 feet. Identifying that person and giving them the time that they need and the coaching that they need to get through the pressure changes is critical for making sure, number one, that they don't have pain inside your chamber. Number two, that they have a good experience so that they're able to then commit to whatever amount of care they need in order to get the benefits that you're trying to get them to, that they're trying to, to achieve. And so spending some time in the office or outside the office on ear clearing and coaching patients through is critical. I use this slide when I teach our certification courses because it's an outline of what some of the equalizing techniques happen to be. Now, you don't need to memorize those although you should, but you could write them down yourselves. I mean, I just pulled those from different, you know, free diving websites, from scuba diving websites, from hyperbarics. There's no secret to this. This isn't complicated and there's no secret that needs to be, you know, released to the public so that we understand these. These are just all the techniques and the tools used in any type of pressure changing environment to make sure that the person in the environment can equalize their ears effectively. Before a patient goes in that chamber, they are going to show me two different ways of equalizing their ears that they use, and we're going to confirm that they're able to do it, that they feel it in both ears, and that they don't have pain in either ear. In other words, if they go to equalize and they have sharp pain in their right ear at the surface, they may already have something wrong with their tympanic membrane. They could have an infection, fluid behind their ears, a whole slew of different issues that they might be experiencing that we just found out before they even went into the chamber eliminating the possibility of them getting hurt in that chamber. So I want them to equalize two different ways. I want them to feel it equally in both ears. And I want them to confirm that they have no pain in either ear. You should do that not only on the first visit, you should do that on every visit. Somebody sounds a little congested. They have allergies. They're getting over a cold or the flu. Equalize your ears. How does that feel? Do you feel it equally in both ears? Do you have pain in either? As long as we're all on the same page, the likelihood that you're going to have a good experience in that chamber, that patient's going to have a good experience in that chamber is, is almost 100%. By skipping this step, which literally could take anywhere from 
20 seconds to maybe two or three minutes. By skipping that step, you're exposing yourself, you're exposing that patient to certain issues in that chamber that now we have to, it becomes a problem solving event during a session, as opposed to a data collection event that could just be happening, you know, at leisure before the session. In our office, part of our patient education, before they even come in during their consultation, I talk about this. Listen, you need to be able to equalize your ears. I see on this, on the r r intake form, you mentioned X, Y, or Z. Um, do you know how to equalize your ears? Yes or no. What methods do you use? You know, oh, I, I yawn. You know, I swallow a few times. I pull on my ear. Everybody makes like a funny face and, you know, makes some sort of like, I do this, you know, on the airplane. Whatever their mechanism is, is perfectly fine as long as it works. But I also want them to be able to do one active version, either a Valsalva or a Frenzel, where they could create pressure in their eardrums at the surface. In other words, if there's no pressure working on me right now, other than the atmosphere, no change in pressure, yawning or swallowing isn't necessarily going to pop my ears, so to speak, or equalize my ears because there's no extra pressure working on me. So they might say, oh, I yawn or I swallow, but they're not going to feel their ears pop when they're doing that. They'll only feel that in the chamber once the extra pressure is working on them. Before they go in that chamber, I want them to show me that they know some other backup plan that they're going to be able to use just in case the swallow or the yawn doesn't work. The three most common would probably be Valsalva, that's the most common by far, the Toynbee, and the Frenzel. The Valsalva is literally pinching and blow. So hold your nose. I say to patients, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to blow your nose like as if you were going to blow your nose, just but build the pressure very slowly. But then what I want you to do is block the air from leaving your nostrils. And so you pinch your nose and then let that pressure build slowly. And you should feel either a crinkling or a popping or a clicking inside your ears. Now, some people, when they do that, their eustachian tubes actually close more. And the harder they push, the less likely they will be able to create that equalization. So give them a few chances. Let them try it a few times. Sometimes one goes and the other one doesn't. Have them do it a few times until they feel, do both of them, do you feel them both equally, and is there pain in either one? The next would be the Toynbee, which is literally the same mo motion, but you're just going to block your nose, your nostrils, and swallow. And a lot of times that could be enough to create that equalization. The last is the Frenzel, which is a little trickier for some people, but some people who can't do the Valsalva actually can do the Toynbee or the Frenzel very easily. The, the Frenzel is more of a K sound. So as opposed to just blowing like the uh, Valsalva, the Frenzel is more of a K sound. A and so you block the same nostrils and you make this K sound at the back of your throat. And that creates a much smaller, faster amount of pressure that they might be able to equalize with. Again, it doesn't actually matter which ones you use. What matters is you have patients understand how important pressure changes are going to be inside that chamber and their ability to equalize that pressure in order for them to have a successful session and to remain comfortable inside the chamber. I'm spending time on this with you because it's one of the only contraindications to hyperbaric, the inability to equalize your ears. So to teach patients this, spend a few minutes before their first session or at least at their first session. These are different techniques. Try a few. Do you have any pain? Do you feel it equally in both ears? The amount of patients that are going to have an issue with their ears is probably less than 5% to begin with. Of the 5% of patients that may have an issue with their ears, this will eliminate you know, 90, 95% of that. And so now all of a sudden, just by doing this process consistently in your office for every new patient, you're almost eliminating the possibility of having these issues in the first place. I can't tell you how many patients come to our office scared because they went to another clinic. They were put into a hyperbaric chamber. None of this was explained. They started having pressure in their ears. They didn't know what to do. Then they started having pain in their ears and then they panicked. And while you may or may not actually cause any physical damage, that situation also creates emotional, you know, emotional trauma with regard to completing their therapy or ever wanting to try hyperbarics again. So again, it's such a simple process to do. It's not a big deal. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it eliminates one of the two absolute contraindications to hyperbarics. So spend a few minutes, learn all of these yourself, and then become proficient 
at trying to explain them and teaching your patients on their first visit. Again, eliminating this as an issue for you in your office. I hope that's helpful for you. I hope you find that uh, information useful for you and your clinic, and uh, we'll see you again next time. So whether you're a chiropractor or a naturopath or an acupuncturist or a DO or even an MD, but you're looking at hyperbarics through this lens, the lens that I'm describing, which is applying hyperbarics for all these off-label conditions, this is the class that teaches that. And right now it's the only class that teaches this type of hyperbarics in this way and that's an actual certification course. Check out hbotusa.com and uh, right across the, the top you'll see upcoming events. You can click on that and it'll show you uh, when our next courses are going to be.